come all, my children of night, as we approach the hour of fright. With toe of toad and eye of newt, my sickly tricksy plan takes root. A raven's core, a pigeon's coo, I'll summon the spookiest games to review. Games with pumpkins and monsters and creeping black cats. There's even games with vampire bats. You're still not scared, but we're not through. Stick around if you dare, for this is Halloween Games 2. The sequel, obviously. Last October, I took a look at some spoopy Halloween games, and this year I plan to do much the same with si Oh. Oh god, is that what my camera quality was like back then? Oh, it's disgusting! Now, I've got a whole hessian sack full of spooky treats for you guys tonight, but first, I believe we have some unfinished business to attend to. If you recall last year, there was a particular subject that just kept cropping up throughout the video. How about a mod which turns pills into jars of candy corn? Candy corn. Candy corn. Candy corn. That's right, candy corn, the American Halloween delicacy that I've never had the pleasure of experiencing. But I figured, in honour of this season and to celebrate May Ray's two year anniversary, I should probably try some. I found a bag for sale online for a reasonable price and you know what? I think I'm going to order it right now. There we go. Now I have Amazon Prime so it shouldn't take too long. Well, that was fast. Oh, uh, happy Halloween, ma'am. Here's your package. Ah, lovely. Thank you very much. Well, I'd just like to personally thank you for choosing UPS as your delivery service. You have a good night now, miss. I saw the sign, and it opened up my eyes. I saw the sign. Do, 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 do. What an obscure reference. Huh. Ah. Oh, well. Now that we have the goods, let's get them open. And here it is, Brock's Candy Corn. You know, it really does seem like something you'd find at a 1910s traveling circus, along with a clown that makes police reports disappear. And so finally, I actually have one of these things in my hand and it does not have the texture I thought it would have. It's really soft, I thought it'd be like Skittles. They're really, oh. Hold on, that... that smells like... Mini-eggs? Why do these smell like mini-eggs? Are these chocolate? Well, here goes nothing. Yeah, they're alright. Yeah, they're, they're very sweet. Um, they're a lot softer than I thought. I thought they'd be like hard, like like I say, Skittles, but no, they're very soft. They, they, I'm kind of getting like fudge almost. They're, they're basically like fudge and caramel and yeah, I mean, they're all right, I suppose. But now that the formalities have been dispensed with, let's refocus and take a look at our first game of the night. Released in the year 1993, Haunting was developed by EA for the Sega Mega Drive. Or the Genesis, if you happen to be born wrong! You play as Polterguy, a green ghost in a leather jacket who's hell-bent on scaring the Sardini family out of their home because... Revenge or something? It's a game with an isometric viewpoint and honestly some pretty impressive graphics. Like Polterguy actually has some transparency when he floats in front of things. That's not something I think the Super Nintendo could do. Ah, well, it's like they say, Genesis does what Nintendo. The 90s was stupid. Like I said, your goal is to haunt the family out of the house, but unfortunately, nobody can see you, so in order to actually scare them, you have to use your ghostly powers to possess things like toys, furniture, or power tools to get the job done. To possess items, or frightems, you simply have to press A when you see a coloured sparkle appear on them. The different colours indicate the various ways a frightem is used. Blue sparkles signify that it's a trap item that will lure a family member in before setting itself off. Green means it's a controllable object that you can move around the room, and orange are manually timed scares that you have to activate at the right moment when a victim is close. 
The aim is to scare a person enough times that their fear level turns from calm to very high, which will cause them to run out of the room. You keep doing this to every family member until they've all left the house screaming. There are a total of four members of the Sardini family. The father of the house, Vito, his wife, Flo, their son, Tony, and their daughter, huh, Wormtail, apparently. Also, really game? The Sardini family with Vito and Tony? Ugh, come on, guys. I haven't seen anything this stereotypically Italian since I found out the Mario Brothers had full names. The clock is your biggest enemy in this game. This green meter at the bottom of the screen represents your ecto level and will slowly run down over time. If it runs out completely, then you get sent to the dungeon, where you have to recollect enough ecto before you can return to the house, all while avoiding spooky hazards such as grabby arms, bats, and rolling skulls. Unlike any other part of the game, you actually have a health bar in these dungeon sections. This little portrait of Poltergeist will start to disappear as you take hits. If it disappears entirely, then it's game over. So I guess you're dead twice now? Is that even possible? Well, hold on. Hey, Professor, is it possible to die twice? That is an interesting hypothesis. Of course, I'll have to do a few experiments before I can get back to you with an answer. Experiments? What sort of exper- <laughs> Professor, uh, are you the- <coughs> Lord, he's dead! We're just gonna put that as a no. You can, however, replenish your ecto without having to go to the dungeon at all. When you scare someone out of a room, they'll drop small puddles of it wherever they were standing, and you just have to remember to collect it before you follow them out of the room which I forgot to do multiple times. Oops. There are loads of everyday household objects to possess in this game with some really creative and at times hilarious results. Such as these spooky trousers. Cower in fear of my trousery aura. Oh God. Yeah, this game can get kind of gory at times. And I know for a fact the Super Nintendo certainly didn't do that shit. They were a family console. Nintendo would never let something like this be released on it. Ah well, it's like they say. <laughs> what Nintendo were at the time very morally against doing themselves. The 90s was still stupid. Once you get over the rather grisly nature of some of the scares, the animations themselves are extremely entertaining and are probably the main reason to actually play this game because... Well, let's be honest, there's not exactly much else going on. Some of them are gross, some of them are funny, and some of them look like they were taken straight out of a cheesy 80s horror flick. Hello, I'm Brock Kennedy for Channel 12 Local News. Our top story tonight... I'm in your fucking house! That said, I find the family doesn't really react to these things in the way a normal person would. Sure, they eventually run out of the house, but only after multiple creepy things happen. Now, if I saw a face staring at me from under my rug, I'd run the fuck out of the house in a heartbeat. But nah, this little girl, she's tough. She ain't giving in that easily. Good on you, sister. After you chase the Sardinis out of their home, level two begins with... the same family in a different house. So you're basically just haunting the Sardinis over and over again. Man, Poltergeist must really want his revenge. In fairness to the game, it does change things up a little by adding new threats like a pet dog that reduces fear levels as well as hostile ghosts that drain your ectometer. These are all things that appear after you reach level 2, which I definitely got past and I'm just not showing you footage of it because... Let's move on to the next game. Released earlier this year, Monster Prom is a spooky-themed dating sim set in a high school of Halloween creatures. However, unlike Hatterful Boyfriend, which we took a look at a few months ago, this isn't a fish-out-of-water story that sees you playing as an ordinary human being, oh no. Instead, you get to pick from four different monster avatars at the start of the game, including Nurgle from Billy and Mandy, Flame Princess, Shaun of the Dead, and the cutest option, which is obviously the one I'm going to pick. On top of being able to choose your character's looks and name, you also get to decide their gender, which is surprisingly not tied to the avatar you pick, but is instead freely up for the player to choose. Look, it's even represented by a pronoun option. I don't even have a joke for that, that's just awesome. In Monster Prom, you have between three to six weeks to develop a relationship with your chosen love interest before asking them out to prom. The game divides each of these weeks as three individual turns, taking place in the morning, afternoon, and evening. 
During the morning and evening turns, you're able to go to any location throughout the school where you'll perform an activity and have a random encounter, whereas in the afternoon you have to attend lunch and get to decide which table you sit at, giving you more control over who you interact with. Eventually though, the game figures out who you're talking to most and will start to gear the random encounters more towards them. Now, who exactly you romance is determined by a few factors, namely of course player choice, but also the results of a personality quiz you take at the start. It's done in the style of a trashy teen magazine and features many of the typical questions you'd expect to see in those kinds of quizzes. What flavour of ice cream are you? What superpowers would you have? Which animal do you want to fuck? You know, standard stuff. The answers to these questions will help determine your in-game stats, which are displayed in the upper right-hand corner. While not mentioned outright at any point during gameplay, meeting certain stat requirements does increase your chance at achieving victory with some of your potential dates. There are six dateable monsters shown at the start of the game, with several secret characters placed throughout the school. There's Miranda, a slightly genocidal mermaid princess, a demon called Damien LaVey, because clever writing, Scott the lovable yet simple-minded werewolf, a hipster vampire called Liam, Polly the party-addicted ghost, and this bitch. But of course, securing a date for prom isn't just about numbers, and while your stats can be increased in-game, the best way of improving your chances with someone is by helping them out with their problems. Throughout the game, scenarios will occur where you're presented with the chance to either help or hinder certain characters. The answers aren't always obvious, so you really have to think about how a character might react to the options available. For example, Miranda here is complaining about how gross the bathrooms in the school are. Now I know she's fond of her home under the sea, so I suggest flooding the bathrooms of salt water to remedy the situation. This surprisingly works. In another game, Polly was about to be kidnapped by an interdimensional prince, so in order to save her, I told the prince that he had to defeat the school's dodgeball team in battle. He was swiftly knocked unconscious. And then there was the time when Damien needed my help hiding a dead body, so I just told him he could chuck it in with all of mine. Bizarre and absurd moments like these are commonplace in Monster Prom, and only accentuated by the well-written nature of the game's characters. Everyone has their own little quirks and unique personalities, and while they're all certainly monsters both in the physical and metaphorical sense, every character still has something to love about them. Except Vera. She's just shit. I doubt I need to bring it up since most of you probably have eyes, but the art style on display here is just plain awesome, and I love that the game features a gallery for you to view all of the art you've unlocked. It's super cool. Another aspect of the game's presentation I am in absolute love with is its soundtrack. Rather than bland and somewhat repetitive stock music like Hadiful Boyfriend used, Monster Prom features songs from a band called Messer Chups, who I'll be honest I'd never heard of before, but damn if I don't love this groovy shit now! The combination of surfer rock with samples taken from jazz, B-movies and theremins is such a strange yet unique sound that it really helps define the game's personality. Unlike Hatterful Boyfriend, I feel like I have real choices to make in this game and that I'm actually in control of my character. It also doesn't hurt that the intro to Monster Prom isn't ten fucking minutes long. I do hate to keep comparing these two games, but they are the only actual dating sims I've played so far, and I must say I think I've enjoyed Monster Prom a lot more than I did Hatterful Boyfriend. Now all they need to do is release some official Monster Prom body pillows and I'll pretty much be set. Playing Monster Prom was just a really enjoyable experience. It was cute, funny, and at times pretty heartfelt. The characters are written well enough that if you give them a chance, you can genuinely feel for most of them. And even if we didn't get the happy ending we wanted, we still had the time of our lives, because we were young and unafraid, and when it was all said and done, we were ready to start living, growing and improving ourselves, never forgetting the memories and friendships we made along the way. And in the end, that's what really matters most. Those were some crazy times, and with any luck, they'll be with us forever. No, oh, hold on, let me just get rid of this. Well, that game left me feeling pretty emotional. So let's play some fucking trash. Deep down in the festering depths of steam, I found a game that had been tragically overlooked by most, and it's known only as Reign of Pumpkins. It's 10 out of 10. Okay, but really, what the fuck is Reign of Pumpkins? The short answer, it's a bad game. The long answer is that it's a pumpkin-based collectathon with some of the worst controls I have ever had the misfortune of using. 
They're just so bad, I can't even really describe it. It sort of feels like you're using one of those trackball mouses, even though you're not. Also, you'll notice that my cursor is permanently on screen. I don't know if that was intentional, but it's there. Oh, and by the way, if that cursor happens to go off the edge of the screen, you start uncontrollably spinning in a circle. Oh, I feel sick. Alright, so what specifically do we have to do in this game? Well, down here in Skeleton Town, there are three different coloured chefs, and it's your job to collect pumpkins for them. Red pumpkins for the red chef, yellow for the yellow, it's fairly self-explanatory. You gotta watch out though, because the pumpkins will randomly explode with seemingly no warning, because game design? Don't worry though, you're well compensated for your trouble. After delivering enough pumpkins, the chefs reward you for your service with... Pies. Yes, pies. Which I guess are supposed to be tallied down here, but the game is so fucking incompetently made it's barely even on screen at all. The pies themselves act as a currency, allowing you to buy upgrades from the various stores in town. These include a shoe shop that makes you run faster, a gym that increases your strength, and a blacksmith that gives you a helmet that literally blocks a third of your damn vision- WHY DID I GET THIS?! So, essentially, this is the game. Running around a tiny skeleton village picking up multicoloured exploding pumpkins while fighting against the utterly abysmal controls. I will say, the one thing that the game has going for it is the aesthetics. I'll be fair to the developers, they nailed the look of Halloween pretty well even if the moon is 38 times too big. There is more I could talk about with Rain of Pumpkins, like the horrendous input lag which gives you the stopping distance of a freight train, or the fact that there's a jump button with seemingly no use whatsoever, or even that the game is credited on Steam as being developed simply by Gary and Eddie. But the fact is, I paid £1.99 for this mistake, so I'm not going to spend any more time on it. Well, that was certainly an experience. Let's see, what's next? Overwatch? But Overwatch isn't a Halloween game! Or does it? No, no, that's not right. Uh, uh, or is it? Since its launch in 2016, Overwatch has become simultaneously one of my favourite and least favourite games to play. Now, to get the obvious question of who I main out of the way, well, that actually depends on the system. On the PS4, I mostly play as Roadhog with a bit of Zenyatta, Brigette, and Junkrat. Whereas on the PC, it's pretty much all Junkrat. Oh, what can I say? I love making shit explode! Like many multiplayer games of today, Overwatch features special holiday events all throughout the year, with one of them being Halloween themed. During this time, it becomes possible to either find or purchase Halloween costumes for your heroes to wear. Some of them are really good, while others are... Okay, you know what, fair enough, they're all good. But on top of the costumes, a new game mode was introduced in 2017 called Junkenstein's Revenge, and that's what we're here to take a look at. The basic premise is that your boy Junkrat has finally broken down entirely, become a mad scientist, and is trying to take over the world with his army of horrors. These include a patched-together Roadhog, a demonic Symmetra, and... Reaper. It's a wave survival game mode, where you and three other players have to fight off multiple waves of zombie robots with the occasional boss fight, similar in concept to Team Fortress 2's Man vs. Machine. You know, back when TF2 was good. <laughs> Unlike the regular modes in Overwatch, Junkenstein's Revenge doesn't allow you to pick from the entire roster of heroes, instead limiting your choices to just a handful of characters. You also can't change Hero at any point during the game, so you really need to think carefully about who you pick. There are two versions of Junkenstein's Revenge, the normal game, which ends after you survive the time limit, and Endless Mode, which is... Endless. On top of just trying to survive, your main objective is to protect the doors of the castle from being broken down. The best strategy I found was one sniper, aka always Widowmaker, a healer, and two DPS characters. Your mileage may vary, but I found this to be the most effective strategy for both staying alive and defending the objective. While playing, you'll probably notice the narration being provided by Reinhardt. He tells the story of your match as though it were an old spooky tale told around a campfire, referring to the heroes by mystical titles rather than their actual names. Zenyatta becomes the monk, McCree the gunslinger, and soldier... well, he basically just stays the soldier to be honest. But the way the game presents the events of the match as they happen through Ryan's storytelling is actually really cool. 
The ground shook as Dr. Junkenstein's creation was revealed. There's not really a whole lot more to say about the gameplay itself. It's fast-paced, exciting, and feels rewarding when you win. It kinda just is a wave survival minigame with a spooky aesthetic. But that won't stop me from enjoying it. Come on, team! Dr. Junkenstein's right there! Let's go stop him before he... Um... What? Uh... I don't- I don't think this is- Oh, fuck! Uh... Guys? Are, are you- are you guys okay? I don't think this is supposed to happen- Whoa! Oh, shit! No, no! This isn't right! This is most assuredly not- Oh... Well, this doesn't look like it's reconnecting anytime soon, so let's just move on. For the past two Halloweens now, I've reviewed a Castlevania game, and this year is no exception. We've seen the first game and its mildly awkward jumping mechanics, and we've had fun with 4's multi-directional whipping. But this year, I say we take it a step further and dive into one of the most beloved entries into the Castlevania franchise. Symphony of the Night. Whoa, 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 whoa. Let's not get ahead of ourselves, this is a pretty big game. So let's start from the beginning. The main menu, that's usually a good place to start. Let's see here, we have file select, name, chance, file, k keep. This font is fucking terrible. Now as this is a PS1 title, it of course opens up with an FMV sequence. Journey back to 1792 and the Transylvanian countryside of Romania. Look, mate, I don't even like going to the shops to get milk, so you're already setting your expectations of me way too high. We then get a pretty cool shot of Dracula's castle from across a dark, misty lake, with Dracula's castle apparently being on loan from RuneScape. Oh, hold on, guys. I think you used the wrong music there. Don't worry. I'll fix it. Much better. So the first level is... Wait, wait. What? The final stage? Well, that was easy. Okay, so it turns out Symphony of the Night begins with the final level of the previous game, Castlevania Dracula X, which as a side note is simultaneously the best and worst title for a game I've ever heard. But what it basically means is we walk about 15 steps and then have to fight Dracula. Die, monster. You don't belong in this world. Oh. Yeah, this game is pretty infamous for its voice acting. It's certainly not the worst I've ever heard, but it can get pretty corny at times. Especially during this opening confrontation between Richter Belmont and Dracula. It just sounds like it was written in five minutes by an edgy 13-year-old. You steal men's souls and make them your slaves. Perhaps the same could be said of all religions. And of course, the famous line itself. What is a man? A miserable little pile of secrets! But enough talk! How about you? What does it even mean? As to be expected, this literal end of game boss fight is pretty tough. Although it's not too bad since you can't actually die. If you run out of health, a little girl comes out and makes you invincible with her SATANIC POWER! Question mark? And it just becomes a matter of time before you beat Dracula and can begin Symphony of the Night proper. And by that, I mean read a huge fucking wall of text. Ah, what would a Castlevania game be without a massive text scroller? Oh yeah, it'd be the first one. The prologue reveals we don't actually play as any of the Belmonts, but rather Dracula's own son, Count Alucard, who first appeared in the 1943 Universal film Son of Dracula. Thankfully, the game does not contain a sprite of an overweight Lon Chaney Jr., but instead depicts Alucard as... the Targaryen. Anyhow, Alucard is on a mission to stop the resurrection of his father by- ah, Hey! That's my shit! I think death just mugged me. So just when you thought you'd figured everything out, the game goes and pulls a force unleashed on you. Twice. I suppose now would be a good time to explain how this game works. You see, unlike the previous entries we played, which were stage-based action platformers, Symphony of the Night is an honest-to-goodness RPG, with stats and everything. Look at all those numbers. This also means we have different weapons and armor. Well, had. 
as you saw, the Grim Reaper decided to nick all of our cool shit, so I guess we'll just have to punch skeletons to death for now. Another major change to the game is in its structure. Rather than simply having to get to the end of a level and maybe fight a boss, the entire game is set within a giant open world map of Dracula's castle. In order to overcome some obstacles or barriers you'll run into, you'll need to obtain certain items or abilities that are located in various places throughout the castle and require a fair amount of exploration in order to find. The castle itself is filled with secret passageways, hidden items, and suddenly appearing boss rooms, and you're never really told exactly what you have to do or where you have to go. All of this can make playing the game feel quite daunting, and I'll be honest, I was completely lost at first. Literally, the moment the game gave me two alternate paths to choose from, I nearly considered giving up. I've lived a very sheltered life. However, you do have an in-game map to help with navigation, and the castle is also peppered with save points and teleportation rooms just to make things a little bit easier. But of course, not everything in this game is different. Sub-weapons return, and yes, the axe is still as annoying as ever, but at the very least, they now allow you to take back your previous weapon if you didn't mean to pick up a new one. The knife is still by far the best option, though. Always go for the knife. The flying Medusa heads are also still here, but now they come in two flavours. Regular and Lemon Hatred. Speaking of enemies, I am noticing just a concerning amount of skeletons, just a statistically puzzling ratio of skeleton to non-skeleton personnel. There's even a guy that's just a giant floating skull. Although, fun fact about that guy, our very own Mr. Bones was the one who actually modeled for him way back in the 90s. So, uh, yeah, that's his claim to fame. <laughs> the game looks absolutely fantastic. The sprite work is gorgeous and the castle's atmosphere is suitably dark and eerie. Though the graphics were apparently a small source of controversy for some. When it came out in 1997, many other games were starting to go to 3D. This clipping from a gaming magazine shows that not everybody was happy with Symphony of the Night's refusal to delve deeper into the third dimension, claiming that the game looked dull and flat compared to the 3D installment of Castlevania that had released on the Nintendo 64. Hmm... Castlevania 64, eh? Foreshadowing. Uh, I don't really have time to look at it right now, so we'll do it next year. Five shadows. That's not even a proper word! Another new feature in this game is the addition of spells, which you perform by inputting very specific button combinations. They're a little bit too much like combos in a fighting game for my liking, but I did at least manage to master a few of them to give me an edge in battle. However, I think the biggest takeaway I got from Symphony of the Night was the amazing sense of progression it had. It wasn't just because I saw that I was leveling up, I actually felt it. I got stronger and gradually started dealing more damage. Through exploration I found new items and gained new abilities like transformations which themselves unlock even more areas of the castle for me to explore. Using both patience and wit, solving puzzles in the game rewarded me with upgraded weapons and armour. Every time I conquered a part of the castle, despite it never directly telling me so, I knew I was making progress. That was, however, until the final boss fight. I had until that point considered myself somewhat decent at the game, by no means a master, but certainly at the very least competent with the game's mechanics and- Wait, no, don't show that! The final boss of the game, rather bizarrely, is Richter Belmont. Now you'd think maybe it was because Richter mistakenly assumed that Alucard was here to resurrect his father, but no. No, in actuality, it was Richter who started this whole thing. He wants to bring Dracula back. Why? I'll let him explain. Count Dracula rises but once every century, and my role is over. If I can resurrect him, then the battle will last for eternity. That is, without a doubt, the worst excuse for a heel turn I have ever heard. So... What, you're just upset you don't get to kill Dracula anymore, so you're going to risk the lives of thousands of innocent people just so you can feel the thrill of it again? Holy fuck, this is a midlife crisis, isn't it? Whatever it is, it's caused Richter Belmont to be almost completely impossible for me to beat. What you're seeing here is my entire first attempt at fighting him. I am trying my hardest here, but it's just not good enough. I'm not good enough. 
I figured maybe the problem was that I was still too weak. After all, this game isn't linear, it's entirely possible I just wasn't ready for him. So I returned to exploring the castle, fighting my way through the hordes of evil, leveling up, getting new gear and preparing properly for the fight of my- <laughs> Ah, for fuck's sake! I have to admit, eventually I needed some help for this part. I just wasn't good enough at the game to get it done on my own. And I'd like to personally thank Mr. Bones for helping me with this difficult part of the game. I couldn't have done it without him. Once Belmont is defeated, we see Dracula's castle dissolve into the sky. Alucard says some sad stuff and goes off to open a casino in Vegas. But honestly, I don't think this is it. There were many aspects of the story left unresolved. Now, who was this Maria woman that I kept running into? What were Richter's real motivations? And why is the currency in this game dollars when we're clearly not in America? Well, it turns out I simply got the bad ending. There is a whole lot more to this game than I experienced in my playthrough, and I am honestly very eager to revisit Symphony of the Night to hopefully get a more satisfying ending. But that isn't going to be tonight. This video is long enough as it is, even for a Halloween special. We played a lot of games tonight, and each of them, yes, even Reign of Pumpkins, just reminded me more of why I love Halloween. It's silly, it's spooky, and sometimes it's a bit rubbish, but it's still one of my favourite times of the year. And I'm so glad you could all join me for it once again. Well, that's all the time we have for tonight. As they say in the old country, Hey up, Chuck. Which roughly translates to thank you all for watching my Halloween special, and I hope you all have a happy Halloween, and remember to be kind and have fun. But before I go, I'd just like to give a little bit of a shout out to Lady K's Magewares on Etsy for this fantastic witch hat she made me. I'll leave a link in the description to her Etsy store and you can go and check out all the awesome stuff she has on offer. But anyway, if you like this video, please remember to give it a like, comment, subscribe and share with your friends. I've been Mayray, and I'll see you all next time. Boo! Thanks for watching, everybody. This video was sponsored by Oven Hand. Do you like ovens? Do you need hands? Well, boy, do we have the Oven Hand for you. The Oven Hand is a sleek, sophisticated, and portable glove that sli can slide d directly into your oven. You can steak. You can hamburg. Why not even baby? Visit www.handintheoven.co.m for more information. The Oven Hand. You'll get yours, you will. That's right, candy corn. The American Halloween delicacy that I've never had the experience of pleasuring. <laughs> Ugh.